Commissioner, the next topic that we turn to is the topic of inappropriate advice. And the first case study in relation to inappropriate advice involves Westpac. The first witness in that case study who's sitting in the witness box is Ms Jacqueline McDowell. Ms McDowell, uh, can I ask whether you'd prefer to take an oath or would you prefer to make an affirmation? Um, an oath, please. Right. Do you mind standing while we administer the oath? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Ms. McDowell. Do sit down. Thank you, Mrs. McDowell. Your full name is Jacqueline McDowell. It is. And you live at an address in the Northern Territory that you've provided to the Commission. I do. Uh, and you work as a registered general nurse. I do. Uh, you've made a statement to the Royal Commission. I have. Uh, that statement's dated the 4th of April 2018. It is. And do you have that statement there with you, Mrs McDowell? I do. Have you read that statement? I have. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? They are. Attend to the statement, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 2.98 will be a uh, witness statement of Mrs McDowell, dated 4 April 18. Mrs McDowell, did you receive a summons to attend today? I did. Do you have that summons there with you? I do. I tender the summons, Commissioner. Summons to Mrs McDowell will be Exhibit 2.99. Mrs McDowell, you are originally from Scotland, is that right? That's correct. Uh, and how long have you lived in Australia? 16 years. And uh, you work as a registered general nurse. How long have you worked in that job? 30 years. 30 years, did yes. you say? Yes. And your husband works as a truck driver, is that correct? That's correct. And in 2015, did you start to think about retiring from your job as a registered general nurse? I did. And where were you living at that time? I was living in Narry Warren in Melbourne. Thank you. And what plans did you have for your retirement at that point? Um, I discussed with my husband that um, I wanted to um, leave nursing and set up um, a bed and breakfast business um, that I could work on and hopefully um, gain that money through that business for our retirement together. And did you have a plan for how you would buy the bed and breakfast business? Yes, we didn't have any funds um, outside anything like savings so we had some self uh, or superannuation funds so um, we discussed it together my husband and I and thought that we would contact the Westpac Bank um, to ask if I would be able to do this um, strategy um, using my self-managed super funds. Did you have a self-managed super fund at that time or superannuation funds uh, that were through your employers? Yeah, we had super funds through our employers, which were Hester and Seabus. Hester and Seabus. Uh, and how much money between the two of you did you have in your superannuation accounts at this time? It came to just over 200,000. Yes, thank you. And so you said that you made the decision to approach Westpac to talk to them about this. That's correct. And in April 2015, did you contact Westpac? I did. And did you do that to seek financial advice about this plan that you had for your retirement? That's correct. Uh, and how did you approach Westpac? Um, I made a telephone call and um, I spoke to someone um, called Monica, whom I explained um, what I would like to do. And I wanted to find out if that would be possible to do through my superannuation fund. Um, Monica told me at that time that um, she would get in contact with a professional advisor um, and get them to call me back. Mm -hmm. And did you receive a call from a financial advisor at Westpac a few days later? I certainly did. And that financial advisor was Mr Krish Mahadevan, is that's, that correct? That's correct. And what do you recall about that conversation that you had with Mr Mahadevan at that time? Yep. So I reiterated um, what I would like to do um, to ask if it was possible. So I said that my husband and I um, combined funds from our supers would be about 200,000. Um, and would it be able for me to purchase a property to live in um, and run a bed and breakfast from? Mm -hmm. And did you talk to Mr Mahadevan in this conversation about 
the sort of purchase price that you were looking at for a bed and breakfast property? Yes, we said round about a million. Round about a million. And was there any discussion in this conversation of your current home and what you should do with that? Well, first of all, um, I did say to um, Krish, who I'll name him as, sorry, because I find it difficult to pronounce his name, um, that um, we did have some debt. Um, and then I did mention to him that we did have a family home. And what did he think about we should do with that? And he did say we should put it on the market. Um, due to us, us having debt, it would, um, by selling it, we could pay off that debt and it would put us in a better financial position for borrowing for the bed and breakfast business that we were going to hopefully get. I see. And did Mr Mahadevan tell you to get a valuation of your house? He did. He asked us to get one straight away. And did you do that? We certainly did. And what was the valuation that you got for your family home? The first valuation we got was um, they valued it at 550,000. Yes. My husband and I thought at the time that that was a little bit over um, exaggerated due to we had a look to see what prices that the houses were going for at the time. Um, but we contacted um, Krish and we told him of the amount that they had given us, but we said that we felt it was a bit over. Chris told us at that time not to worry, it was just a ballpark figure to get things rolling. I see. And did you then have a meeting with Mr Mahadevan later in April 2015? Yes, we did. Uh, and what did you tell Mr Mah Mahadevan at that meeting? Again, um, my husband and I reiterated exactly um, what we wanted to do with our funds, with our, our, our super. We said that we wanted to purchase a property to run as a bed and breakfast for us to live on and for me to run the bed and breakfast f for that so as that we could um, make some money um, for us for our later retirement. Could I ask you to look, Mrs McDowell, at the first exhibit to your witness statement, uh, which will be behind tab one. That's wit.0900.0001.2015. Uh, is this a document that you received from Mr Mahadevan either during or following that first meeting? I'm, I'm sorry, I just this can't... This is behind... <coughs> behind one. 001, yes. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Uh, and did you understand that this document had been completed by Mr Mahadevan using information that you and your husband gave him during the first meeting? Yes. Yes. Uh, now... Do you recall telling Mr Mahadevan in this meeting that you wanted to establish a self-managed superannuation fund? We just wanted to know how we would go about it. And um, Krish says his, um, how you would do that was you would do a self-managed super fund. Yes. Um, and that's what we were at the understanding, explained what that was. And could I ask you to turn to 0015 in this document? See, Mrs McDowell, the heading on this page, Assets and Liabilities. Yes. And we see there under Lifestyle Assets a reference to principal residence, current value of $550,000. Is this a reference to information that you gave Mr Mahadevan about your family home and the valuation that you had then received, which was $550,000? Yes, that was from the first evaluation, but yes. we did seek another valuation after and that. And that was later in and time. And that was later. Yes, yes, and we'll come to that. Uh, so at this point, does this reflect in this first table the information that you gave Mr Mahadevan about your assets, your home valued at $550,000, your home contour motor vehicles, one at $32,000 and one at $21,000? Yes, that's correct. And did you also tell Mr Mahadevan that you had $7,000 in a Westpac account, a joint account, and $590 in a Westpac reward saver account, as we see in the second table. Yes, that's correct. Uh, then if we turn to 0017, do we see, you see here a reference to your liabilities in the top table there? Yes. Uh, 
and we see there a reference to a mortgage that you had over your family home, which had $404,000 owing. Yes. A personal loan with Westpac for $44,000. Yes. And two car loans, is that, is that an Audi finance loan for $30,000 and a Toyota finance loan for $10,000? That's correct. Right. And so this is the information you gave Mr Mahadevan about your liabilities? That's correct. And do we see in the table below the information that you gave him about your superannuation accounts? Yes. A Hester account that you had with a current value of uh, approximately $166,000 and a CBUS superannuation fund that your husband had with a current balance of approximately $52,000, taking the total balance to somewhere around $200,000. That's correct. Uh, and did you also tell Mr Mahadevan about some credit cards that you had? Yes, we told him about some credit cards we had with Westpac Bank also. And do you remember what you told him about those credit cards? Yeah, I said we roughly had um, 5,000 on one card and 6,000 on the other. Okay. And could I ask you uh, then to um, turn to uh, page 0020, which deals with your insurance position at the time. But before I ask you some questions about that, having given Mr Mahadevan the information about your assets and liabilities and superannuation balance that we've just seen, what did Mr Mahadevan say to you about whether you could use your superannuation to set up a self-managed superannuation fund and borrow to purchase a bed and breakfast? He said that because we had over $200,000 that that was um, sufficient um, to go ahead with our strategy of um, purchasing a property to buy a bed and breakfast, but if it was under that amount it, we probably wouldn't go ahead, but that was sufficient funds to go ahead with that plan. Thank you. And turning back to this page about your insurances, does this reflect the information that you gave Mr Mahadevan about the insurance policies that you had? We see there a reference to a life insurance policy that you had through your Hester Super with $70,000 worth of cover. Yes. And a reference to your husband's life insurance policy through his CBUS superannuation with coverage of $158,000. Yes. And we see also that your husband had TPD insurance through his CBUS super uh, with a value of $79,000. That accurately reflects the insurances that you had at that time? It does. And if we look at the following page, 0021, we'll see that there was an additional policy that you had, which was an income protection policy. Uh, do you see that there? Yes, I and do. And that was also paid for through your, your Hester superannuation fund? It was. Thank you. Um, did you discuss with uh, Mr Mahadevan in this meeting uh, any changes that should be made to your insurance cover? Um, Chris said to us that due to the um, property that we wanted to purchase for our um, goal of the bed and breakfast um, being a million dollars that we were sort of looking at the price of. He said we would need to take out that assurance equivalent to that so as if anything happened during death that that would um, cover us and um, it would make everything okay for if anything happened either myself or my partner. So insurance cover to cover you up to a million dollars, is that what yes, you're saying? Yes, up to a million dollars each of us. Each of you, each okay. Each of us, yes. And did you discuss with Mr Mahadevan in this meeting how long it would take to put your strategy to purchase a bed and breakfast into place? Yes, he said about three months, but not longer than five. Thank you. And did another person from Westpac join you at some point during this meeting? Yes, we were joined by Carl, who was a business banker during this meeting. He didn't stay for the whole meeting, but he did come in. And what do you recall of what Carl said during that meeting? Yeah, well, when he came in initially, um, Krish um, sort of discussed briefly that we had over 200,000 in our, our um, super funds, our Hester and CBUS, and what we were going to, wanting to do with it as a strategy. And um, Carl came in and he said, 
you're in the right place. I'm the money man. I'm the man that can lend you up to $2 million. And what did you say to that? I said, well, we're not looking to um, go for $2 million, but I felt that, you know, because of what we were wanting to borrow for this strategy through our, our, our funds, that, well, that was going to be possible and we were all on the right page. Mm -hmm. uh, did you discuss the sorts of properties that you were looking for as a bed and breakfast in this meeting? We did discuss, yeah. We had one property in mind um, that we did bring the information that my husband left in the car. So Carl asked my husband to um, retrieve that information and bring it into the meeting. Um, that first property was in a place called Beechworth, and that property was valued at about 1.4 million. So we showed that to Carl, the information that we had gained on that property. Um, and Carl said that we couldn't, that one wouldn't be able to be done through the self-managed super funds because the assets were worth more than the property and you can't do that through that, um, that it needed to be the property. So we took that into account um, and we took on what he said to us and we said, okay, we'll look at further properties um, that don't have the assets involved because we now knew that it was only the property that you could put through the self-managed funds to run as a bed and breakfast business. And what impressions did you have of Mr Mahadevan and Carl during this meeting? How did you feel about what they told you? Look, I, I felt that Carl was a little bit blasé as a professional person, how he came on saying that he was a money man. But then I thought, well, OK, he seems to know what he's talking about. I still felt confident in Krish as a professional financial advisor through the Westpac Bank, who is a big bank. And I felt that going through a big bank like this that you would be okay and they would look after you and they would be truthful um, in answering and taking on board what you wanted to do with your financial monies of your um, superannuation through that advice. So when you left this meeting, did you think it was possible for you to achieve your goal of using your superannuation to purchase a bed and breakfast to operate in your retirement? We certainly did. Yes, thank you. Um, now, following this meeting, did you obtain another valuation of your house? We certainly did. And did you do that for the reasons that you explained earlier, that you thought the first valuation was too high? Yes, we did think it was too high because we had looked at other prices of similar properties within our area. And what was the revised value you got in that second valuation? The revised value was between 480000 and 500000 and after you got that valuation, did you take steps to put your home on the market? We, um, we called um, Krish first to, um, rem um, just to um, let him know about the new price so that he could put it into the paperwork, like he said earlier on. And um, we, um, he said to, we, we did put, he said to get, put, not get, he said to put the house on the market as soon as possible, and we went ahead and did that. Yes. Now... In June of that year, having had this first meeting in April, in June of that year, did you have another meeting with Mr Mahadevan? Um, yes, in June we did. I can't remember the exact date. Yes. And do you recall at that meeting Mr Mahadevan presenting you with a formal document that contained his financial advice? Yes. Uh, and could I ask you to turn to the second exhibit in your statement? WIT 09000010037. Yes. We'll just wait while that comes up on the screen, Mrs. McDowell. Uh, is this the document that uh, Mr. Mahadevan presented to you and your husband in this second meeting? It is. And if we turn to 0038 within that document. We see there at the top areas of, of advice relevant to you. Jacqueline and Hugh, in our meeting, we spoke about Jacqueline and Hugh, you wish to establish an SMSF and discussion around personal insurances. And if we look at the following page, 0039, we can see that the statement of advice sets out information about your cash flow on the left-hand side with your salaries, 
and then information about your insurance situation and superannuation situation in the column on the right hand side. Yes. And if we turn to the following page, 0040, we see information that Mr Mahadevan has included about your assets and liabilities. Do yes. you see there? Yes. Um, now, if we could turn to 40041, the following page, we see a reference to your goals. In the first dot point there, Jacqueline and Hugh, you wish to establish an SMSF with a view to be able to invest in a direct property in the future as part of your retirement investment strategy. And if we move to the following column, Jacqueline and Hugh, you are planning to purchase and run a B&B &B business as part of your retirement strategy. You prefer to buy an existing B&B &B business, including an existing property to run the business from. If that cannot be achieved, you will buy a property and start the business yourself. You do not have any surplus funds to do this outside super, but you have approximately 200,000 in your super funds, which you can use. If we turn then to the recommendations given by Mr Mahadevan in this advice, starting at 0043, perhaps we could have um, 0043 and 0044 brought up on the screen at the same time. And we'll see the two recommendations. The first recommendation was for you to establish a new self-managed superannuation fund. Yes. And the second recommendation was to roll over your superannuation accounts into the self-managed superannuation fund. Yes. And then if we turn to 0047 and 0048, we see Mr Mahadevan's recommendations about insurance. Yes. And these are summarised on 0049. We see there a summary of the insurance policy recommendations um, made by Mr Mahadevan. We see that Mr Mahadevan recommended that you take out new insurance policies, each of which was through Westpac. Yes. And he recommended $1 million worth of life insurance cover for each of you. That's Do you correct. see that there? Yes. And he recommended $150,000 of TPD cover for each of you. Yes and $150,000 of income protection cover for each of you. That's correct. I got that right. I'm sorry, but the income protection policy um, was not $150,000. We don't have that figure in there. Do you see the reference there to a monthly amount for you of $5,590 in income protection? and $4,280 a month for your husband in income protection. Yes, I see it now, yes. And in income protection. Yes, I see it now, yes. Yes. Uh, then could we turn to 0058? And we see what Mr Mahadevan has recorded as the key benefits of his advice. Yep. Uh, and you see there at the top of the first column, Jacqueline and Hugh, as you are planning to purchase and run a B&B &B business, including purchasing a property to run the business from as part of your retirement strategy, by establishing an SMSF and rolling over your existing super funds to the SMSF, this will allow you to purchase a direct property using your super funds down the track. You do not have any surplus fund outside super to purchase the property. Yes. And could I ask you then to look at 0059, which is the page of the advice that set out the costs to you flowing from this advice. And do you see there that the one-off costs at the top of the page, you were to pay $3,850 for the preparation of this advice? Yes. And $1,430 for the implementation and processing cost connected with the advice. Yes. So a total upfront cost of $5,280. Yes. Did you make that payment to Mr Mahadevan at Westpac? Yes, we made that payment by credit card. Yes. Uh, and then 
we see there are ongoing costs as well. There was an ongoing advice cost of $3,000 per annum. Uh, did Mr Mahadevan discuss this ongoing advice cost with you? No, I can't remember that being discussed. Did, did, did you understand that you were going to be paying $3,000 a year to Mr Mahadevan for ongoing advice? Mm, not that I can remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and this page also tells us uh, under the table that there would be establishment, annual administration, audit and corporate trustee fees for establishing and maintaining the self-managed super fund, estimated to be $3,905. I knew that there would be an amount to pay to Heffron who was going to be looking after the funds, but I can't recall um, the amount that they actually said, or he actually said at that time. Do you recall Mr Mahadevan discussing that amount with you? Not really. Okay. And could I ask you to look at the following page, 0060. And this page sets out the insurance premiums that you and your husband would have to pay under the new insurance policies for life, TPD, trauma and income protection. Do you see there that the insurance policies that Mr Maher had even recommended would require you and your husband to pay annually just short of $27,000 in yeah. Westpac insurance premiums. Yes. Thank you. Um, now, the following page, 0061, is entitled Other Payments. Do you recall Mr Mahadevan discussing this page of the advice with you? No, not at all. And do you see there that this sets out the commissions that Westpac would receive as a result of you accepting Mr Mahadevan's advice? No, not at all. You, you, do you see that? I see it, yes, yes, I do see it here. But and and are you saying this was not something that was discussed with you? That's what I'm saying, it wasn't discussed. And do you see when you look at it now that um, Westpac was going to receive initial commissions, upfront commissions of $27,180 from, from the insurance policies that were recommended for you? Yeah, I'm seeing it now in front of me, yes. And do you see also that uh, Westpac was going to receive on an ongoing annual basis an additional $2,471 in commissions in connection with those insurance policies. Yes, I do. Uh, and there is a second section on this page entitled Paid by Westpac to Others. Uh, do you see there that it indicates that there was a possible payment to Mr Mahadevan possible plan a share of revenue to Krish Mahadevan of $16,690 flowing from this advice. Yes, I do see that there as well. Did Mr Mahadevan discuss that with you? Never. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, after this meeting, did you authorise Mr Mahadevan to go ahead and implement the advice? We did. We asked him to go ahead and... Um get the self-managed super funds up yes. and running, yes. And did you authorise him to take out the insurance policies that were recommended in this advice? Yes, because we, we felt that um, Mr Market Krish, um, because of he knew that the type of property or the cost of the property we were looking to buy and live in to do our bed and breakfast from was uh, it was what he said, so we felt with his, with his professional um, advice he knew what he was talking about and we felt that yet yeah, we're all we're all going together there he's looking after us and um, what he's given us is to keep everything okay if if, if in any event that anything had to happen yes. so we were happy with that advice at that time and did you talk to your family about your plans having received this advice yeah we were really we were really excited so we told um our kids, um, I have a grown up son and daughter and some very close friends and we told them what we were doing and they say, that sounds brilliant, good on you mum, you'll be good at that. Yeah. And did you then proceed to sell your house? We certainly did. Yes, and when did that happen, do you recall? Yeah, it happened quite quickly, I think it was around about July. Mm -hmm. And how much did you receive for selling your house? We sold our house for 485000 
And what did you do uh, with any money you had from the sale of the house? Well, we cleared off our mortgage, which we owed the 404000 um, We paid off the Westpac loan, which was the 44000 and we paid off the two credit cards, and we didn't have enough left from the um, equity to pay off the two car loans that we had. Yes. And where did you live after you sold your home? We rented um, a furnished accommodation in a place um, down in the peninsula called McRae, and we put our um, family um, belongings into storage. Mm -hmm. And at this time, were you still looking for the bed and breakfast property that you wanted to buy? We certainly were. And did you have a further meeting with Mr Mahadevan and Carl after you had identified some further potential properties? We did. And was that in November 2015? That's correct. And what do you recall of that meeting? So we went to we went to that meeting and we took along another two properties that we had looked at. One was um, in Lakes Entrance, which consisted of a private property for us to live in, and it had seven two-bedroom cottages. The other one was in a place in Victoria called Bright, so they were both still in Victoria, and that was just one home which um, had a three bedroom for us to live in, and it had another five rooms that we could lay out as a bed and breakfast. Yes. Uh, so you took information about those properties with you to the meeting? We did. And did you discuss those properties with Mr Mahadevan and with Carl? We did. Uh, and what did they say to you? We gave Carl the, the first one, which was the one with the cottages, which was um, down at Lake's entrance. And he told us that we couldn't use the self-managed super funds for that because it was on two titles. We said, OK, that's fine. So we gave him the other one, which was on one title because it was just one big house. And he again said that we couldn't use that one either. So we got a bit confused at that point. During this time, Cal made a phone call, and I can't remember who he made the phone call to, because we kept saying, but why can't we do it? You said if it was on one title um, that we could, and he just proceeded to make a phone call to someone whom, at that time, I can't recollect who this was, but it didn't seem at the time that he was really very interested on what the person was saying to the questions that he was asking. And then when he came off the phone, and um, my father said, no, you can't, no, you cannot do that. He says, you can, we can't even borrow, we can only borrow you about 200,000. So at that time, I, I got really a little bit upset and a little bit emotional. And I says, this has just been a complete waste of time. We've went through all this for five, six, whatever many months it is. And you're now telling us that from being able to borrow 2 million, that we can't even borrow 200,000. So at that time, I said, there's no way that we can do that strategy and the goals and the advice that we gave you because there's no property out there that's ever going to be that you can buy that we're going to be able to do that from. So I felt very upset. Um, and I just said to them, so where, what do we do now? Where do we go from here? And Chris said, oh, but you can still buy an investment property. I said, well, I don't think that that makes any sense. I said, we sold our family home on your advice. We now don't have a family home to live in. So why would we then buy an investment property to rent to someone else when we haven't even got a property to live in ourselves? <laughs> Sorry. So um, I got very upset and, and walked out of the meeting and Chris was just saying a few things to my husband, and my husband said, yeah, you, oh, just, he, he kept saying, just call us if you need to discuss, because we still need to sort something out. And we went home, and after a cup of coffee, like you do, and a little bit of time, um, we, we, we weren't happy, so we decided um, to make... Um, to send an email to the Westpac Bank to discuss with them how we felt that the professional financial advice that we had been given um, and where do we go from here. So I sent an email in regards to all the information that we've just went through and the position that we were now in. Before we come to that email, what did you understand in that meeting to be the reason you couldn't now borrow the amount of money you needed to purchase a bed and breakfast? What I recollect is 
you could never live in a property and run a business from it, which was what we re reiterated on many occasions during our meetings, that we would live in the property and run the bed and breakfast from it. And I just feel now that all the time after all the insurances, the money taken for the professional advice that we were given, that all along at the end of it, I felt that the aim was that they were just aiming for us to take out um, a property to rent to someone else. And I, I'm sorry, I've just forgotten the name, um, just what I said earlier. An investment property, which you can't live in, you have to rent to other people. So I just felt after that that we had been led up the garden path and lied to just for the Westpac Bank to get their bit of the insurances, which were now being <laughs> taken from our super funds. So that was dropping down. Also, the insurance that we had to pay out with the super fund, because you can only take so much insurance from that, which we were told was getting taken out our personal account. And then we were now in accommodation, which we were paying over the odds for because it was furnished and we, could, we didn't feel that we could um, commit to a 12-month lease because we thought that we were going to be running our bed and breakfast. Did you tell your family about what had happened in this meeting? No, I was too embarrassed to tell anybody. I felt humiliated, stupid that I didn't. I'm quite an educated person. Um, and I feel that when you go for advice, it's a bit like you go to a doctor and he's been trained to deal with your problem. You go to a lawyer and the same thing. So I felt that Carl and Chris, being professional financial advisors and business bankers through the Westpac Bank, that we um, had been to a big bank that we had banked in for 16 years and I never thought that I would be lied to. I thought what I was being told was the truth and I just felt that I didn't see it and I just felt embarrassed and I couldn't tell my family or friends. I just told them what we had changed our mind. Mm -hmm. And you said you emailed to Westpac uh, after this meeting uh, and that email contained a complaint. It Is that right? Did. Yes. Uh, and how do you feel about the way your complaint was handled by Westpac? There was n nothing was in a hurry about it. So I did get an email back from Danielle Purcell saying that she had read her complaint and the Westpac Bank do take matters very seriously in regards to that. And she would get back to me in due term. But because it was round about the Christmas area, the Christmas time, sorry, everything just seemed to take forever in a day. So your complaint is annexed to your witness statement at WIT 0900 behind tab three, Mrs McDowell. Yes. Seems we're having uh, trouble pulling that document up, but I'm sure it will come up on screen at some point, uh, Mrs McDowell. But in response to that complaint, uh, did Westpac make an offer to pay you some compensation in February of 2016? They did. Did they offer to pay you $17,988? They did. And did you accept that offer? We did not. And why not? Because we felt that in the mission statement that the West, Bank, the West Pack Bank say in their mission statement that if they get it wrong, they'll put everything right. And by that $17,000, that was only going to um, put back what we had paid for the advice um, and those costs. It wasn't going to put us back in a home. And did uh, Westpac make a further offer to you in March of 2016 to pay you $50,988? They did. And did you accept that offer? We didn't. And why not? Again, it was, um, that was them just going to put back um, the insurances that they had taken from our self-managed funds. Um, and again, 
just covering all the other monies that we put out towards our professional financial advice. And again, it wasn't given us a deposit or stamp duty to get us back into your house, which we now didn't have. Did you have any assistance when you were responding to these offers, Mrs McDowell? Did you have a lawyer or anyone else assisting you with the process? No, we didn't have anyone. We just did it ourselves because we couldn't afford to pay a lawyer. Yes. Uh, and that offer to pay approximately $50,000, was that expressed to you as Westpac's final offer? Yes. Uh, and I see now we have the um, email containing your complaint. Uh, and if we could move from that to uh, tab four, which is WIT 0900 I haven't got... We, uh, not oh. quite, so we're looking for 0078, which yes. is tab four. Yes, I've got it now. I'm sure you have it, Mrs McDowell. I'll just wait till we have the same document on the screen. We see this is the letter containing um, the first offer uh, to make a payment to you on the 25th of February 2016. Yes. And if we could go back to the document that we just had up, which was 0085, we'll see that was the letter from March containing the second offer uh, to make a payment to you. Uh, then uh, you've said you rejected this offer. Did you then make a complaint to the Financial Ombudsman Service? Yes, we did. And how did you know about the Financial Ombudsman Service? It was on some of the, the bottom of the paperwork um, from the Westpac Bank. Yes. And if we then go to the sixth exhibit in your statement, which is 0088, we see your email um, to the Financial Ombudsman on the 28th of March 2016. Yes. So this was how you initiated the process with the Financial Ombudsman Service? Yes. And if we turn to the next exhibit, which is 0092, we see the recommendation that was made by the Financial Ombudsman Service. If we turn to the second page, 0093, we see that this recommendation firstly was made on the 27th of February 2017 which was almost a year after you made your complaint on the 28th of March 2016 in the document we just saw. Yes. And we see there that the recommendation uh, down the bottom of the page was in your favour. Yes. And the FSP, the financial services provider, Westpac, um, a recommendation was made that they pay you and your husband $79,322. Uh, this being a recommendation from the Financial Ombudsman Service was open to you and Westpac to accept or reject. What did you do when you received this recommendation? We rejected the offer. Yes. And do we see there before we leave this document that the key findings made by the Financial Ombudsman Service above the recommendation, which are that the financial services provider Westpac was required to consider whether the advice was viable and advise the applicant of the risks once he knew they intended to sell their house. And in the next paragraph, the advisor's actions caused the loss, but for the failing, the applicant would have not proceeded with the strategy and retained their industry funds. So having rejected this recommendation, uh, Mrs McDowell, was the process then that that required the Financial Ombudsman Service to make a formal determination of your complaint? Yes, that was the next level, yes. Yes, and if we go to your final exhibit behind tab 8, which is 0101, and we bring up the second page, 0102, we see firstly that this determination was made at the top of the page on the 17th of August 2017, which was almost 18 months after you made your complaint to the Financial Ombudsman Service. Yes. And we see there that the determination was in your favour down the bottom of the page under 1.3. Yes. The determination is in favour of the applicants 
within 30 days of the applicant's acceptance of this determination, Westpac must pay the applicant $47,413 for the losses on the sale of the house and $60,061 into the nominated superannuation funds. Um, so uh, this was the determination made on the basis listed above under issues and key findings. Again, the advisor should have advised the applicants the strategy to purchase a BNB was not realistic for their circumstances. The advisor's actions caused the loss, but for their advice, but for the advice, the applicants would not have started the strategy and sold their home. They would not have purchased the level of life insurance the advisor recommended and would have retained their existing superannuation arrangements. Did you accept this determination, Ms McDowell? Yes. Yes. Uh, what can you tell the Commissioner about what this process was like to experience? And I assume, again, you didn't have assistance as you negotiated this process. What was this experience of getting to the point of receiving a determination in your favour in the Financial Ombudsman Service like? It was very difficult. Um, every time we put information in, we didn't hear anything. And when we contacted them, they said that that case manager had left. You were now going to another case manager. We had to um, refurnish all our information again. The same thing again, that case manager had left and so on and so on until we finally got someone that seemed to take notice. Did Westpac pay you the $47,413 we see referred to in this document? They did. And what did you use that money for? To pay off the debts that we got into while we were going through all this. And did you have any left over to put towards the purchase of another house? We didn't. And did Westpac make the payment of $60,000 odd dollars into <coughs> nominated superannuation accounts? They did. Which superannuation account did they put that into? They put that back into the self-managed super fund. Mm -hmm. And is that where you want that money to be? No, we want that money to be put back into our Hester and Seabus, which we've reopened due to the jobs that we're in again. And again, we were offered advice and told someone would call us from the Westpac Bank to help us put these funds um, from Hester and Seabus, who was holding our self-managed super funds, back into um, CBUS and HESTA. And nearly a year later, the same thing again. Every time we put more information into someone, we don't hear anything. We call back or send an email to be told that someone else has taken over it. You need to give all this information again. Subject to say that the super funds is still with Heffron, not in Hester and Seabus, and they're still taking their commission and we're still no further forward. I still, we, the, the new person again is still asking us to furnish the same information that were furnished three times and it's very exhausting. How long have you been trying to transfer the $60,000 out of the self-managed superannuation fund and into your Seabus and Hester superannuation funds? It's got to be coming up for a year now. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Mrs McDowell, you moved to the Northern Territory in January 2017, is that right? That's correct. And that was while your complaint was working its way through the Financial Ombudsman Service process? That's correct. And why did you move to the Northern Territory at that time? My husband and I had to move to the Northern Territory um, because we had to get jobs that paid a bit more money than we were earning here to try and get us um, to gain enough money for a deposit and stamp duty to get us to buy our own home for our retirement. It wasn't through choice. It was um, because the money there for the jobs that we do is a lot more than what we're earning here. And what jobs are you both doing in the Northern Territory at the moment? I'm still a registered nurse, um, nurse practitioner in an Aboriginal clinic, and my husband works on the mines. Thank you. Um, now. Have you been able to purchase another home since you moved to the Northern Territory? Not yet, we're still saving. So you still live in rental accommodation? We do. Uh, before all of this happened, when were you planning to retire? I was planning to retire around about 60. 
Uh, and when do you currently think it's feasible for you to retire? Probably when I can't walk, probably when I'm in a wheelchair or a Zimmer frame, because it looks like I'll be working till I'm 80. Have you told your children about what happened with all of this now? I first told my daughter the night after I got the telephone call from the Royal Commission to ask me to appear. Um, and I told my daughter what was happening, where I was going, and she says, Mum, why didn't you tell us? There is nothing for you to be embarrassed about. Um, and I've only then told my son, who's in the UK at the moment with his family, and again, they said, there's nothing for you to be embarrassed about. You went for financial advice and you were led up the garden path, which is absolutely awful. Mrs McDowell, finally, why have you decided to tell your story as part of the Royal Commission hearings? I've decided to tell my story because I wouldn't wish this to happen to anyone again. I want it to get out there that when the banks, Westpac or other, train these people up, to be professional advisors, that they tell the truth and they don't skimmy by things and make you feel that anything's possible. And then all of a sudden, they pull the rug from under your feet after they have gained all that money from you and transferred everything in your trust. Because at the moment, I don't know if we are ever going to be able to get into our ho own home again. Hopefully we will. Um, my furniture is still in storage, I'm still renting and I just want people out there just to be very, very careful, even as an educated person, deep down in their paperwork and the way that they speak to you, it's just they're not truthful and I will never, ever trust anybody again, even if they say they're a professional this or a professional that, it's all just to gain money for their side. We're all here just normal people working and trying to earn a living. Some of us earn more than others, you know, and we all just want to try and get a property and have a little bit of buy for our retirement. And I just feel that through this horrible situation through the Westpac Bank, the advice that we were given, a bank that's a big bank that I've been with for 16 years, for them to do that to their customers is absolutely and utterly disgusting. And I hope no one ever has to go through it again. Thank you, Mrs McDowell. I have no further questions, Commissioner. I'm, I'm told that my tendering of the statement did not extend to the exhibits to the statement. I want to make sure that I have tendered both the statement and the exhibits. Yes, thank you. You ought to take a break, Mrs McDowell. Yes, please. All right, we might uh, come back at uh, 10 to midday, I think. Uh, Mrs. McDowell, are you? Ready to go on? Yes, all good. Yes. Does any party other than Westpac seek leave to examine her? No. Yes, Mr Sheehan. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mrs McDowell, my name's Sheehan and I'm here to represent Westpac and forgive me for keeping you just a couple of minutes longer, but it will only be a couple of minutes. Um, uh, I just wanted to go back to uh, the time before you went to the first meeting at which you met Krish and Carl. Um, your um, at that time, would I be right to think that you had a, a general understanding that banks had policies about how much they would lend on property, lend on a house? Yes, absolutely. And um, in, the, in the course of the meeting with uh, Krish and Carl, when Carl was there, uh, there was some discussion about how much the bank would be prepared to lend on a house property. The only thing that was said, which was what Chris had relayed to Carl in the first meeting, was what we had in our funds and that we had no money outside that. There was nothing else discussed except that Carl said that he could lend us up to um, two million. There was nothing else discussed about how much we could or couldn't borrow. We thought that with the information that was given from um, Chris, that he was, we were under the understanding that Carl thought that with their strategy of borrowing for a million that it was, but there was nothing else discussed. He didn't ask us anything else, so we thought he had already looked into this. I see. So um, what I wanted to suggest to you was that in the course of the meeting, um, Carl said to you something to this effect, that 
the bank's policy is to lend, the bank will lend up to 80% of the value of a house. I can't remember that. I can't remember that. If he'd said that, that would have fitted neatly with your plans. As well, it would, have, it would have given us a bit more of an understanding what we could borrow. But when Carl said that we could borrow up to two million, that's what we thought we could borrow up to. So when you're told that, you think he's he's the man that's discussed with the financial um, advisor with what we have and what we haven't got. And if he's told him that at that meeting, and he's then come out after that information from the financial advisor um, to say that, well, I'm still your man, I can borrow up to you two million, would you not just think that, oh, well, he's read into it, that must be what I can borrow? Do you think that I would have to then read further into it when I'm sitting there with the business banker? He's the man that knows. He should have asked us or said to us, oh, well, Mrs. McDowell, you can only borrow 60% or 50% or 80%. Before you went to see the bank, you were planning to spend about a million dollars. That was your hope That's correct. on a property. And you had about 200,000 in the super fund. That's correct. So if you could borrow 80%, that would have looked about right. Yes. OK. Now, when you saw him again, uh, saw Carl again, yes. so this was the last face-to-face -face meeting you had, I think, in November of November, 2015? Yes. Okay. Uh, and this was the meeting that you came away from extremely disappointed because your plans now looked unrealisable. Yeah. Now, um, in that meeting, um, one of the key subjects of conversation was how much the bank was then prepared to lend given that you had the $200,000. And what I want to suggest to you is that in, in that meeting, um, either uh, Carl said to you that the bank's lending limits had changed and it could only lend now 70% on the value of the property. Does that sound, is that consistent with your recollection? See, I can't, and I can't remember about the percentages. Um, it may be correct, it may be not, but I, I'm not going to commit to saying that I understood. But then, if that was the case, by this time it's too late. So uh, I'll just... This, yes, sorry. That's, that's all right. I'm not meaning to criticise, but... Um, it, it might seem... What I want to suggest to you is that he, he said that if the bank's lending limit is 70% and your, the amount that you can contribute is 200000 that the maximum the bank can lend you is only... 450,000. In other words, it had come down from 800,000 to 450. Does that, is that consistent with your recollection of this second yeah. meeting? Yeah. And, and, and you obviously were very disappointed by that change. Yes, especially when we were told that we couldn't really borrow anything to get the properties. I just felt it was a little bit too late after everything had been transferred over yeah. and, and the house had been sold. And your view at that time was that if you had 650000 that wouldn't be enough for your plan? Well, one of the properties, the, the one that was under the one title that I mentioned that was in Bright was on for 699 So we thought that even that might have been realistic, but at the end of that meeting, that wasn't realistic either. We couldn't afford that. Right. Thank you. That was all I wished to ask. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything, Ms. Hall? No, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Mrs. McDowell, you're excused further attendance. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Mr. Sheehan, one matter of uh, information which you may or may not be able to assist me with, uh, Mrs. McDowell mentioned an organisation called Heffron. Are you able Heffron. to say whether that uh, is an organisation associated with Westpac? Um, I believe it is not, but I'll have that checked. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Mrs McDowell, you may. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I should say one thing, Commissioner, on a slightly different subject. Um, um, it doesn't need to keep no, Mrs if, McDowell if here. You can go and take a seat in the back yep, of the yep. courtroom if you wish, Mrs McDowell. Uh, in, li in light of uh, some of her evidence, we'll seek to tender uh, two documents that uh, I think are not presently available on the court book. I don't need to take Mrs McDowell to them. 
but just to explain what they are for future reference. Um, tab uh, 25 to Mr. Um, Mr. Wright's second statement has an undated email. It's, the document is WBC 503-001-1329. We, we have found a dated version of that email, which we would seek to Do tender. Do the parties to the email? Uh, uh, Mr. Mardeven and the witness. Well, you say you want to refer to them. You don't think it necessary to take the witness to them. Have you to spoken to counsel assisting about these documents? Uh, no, because it only arose from the evidence. I understand that that will limit the use that we can make of them in submissions, but uh, they will be material in uh, various ways to the issues that are likely to arise. Yes. Yes, you mentioned a second document. The second document is um, uh, the information that appears on the website that is referred to in that email. Yes. And uh, I'll seek to attend to those documents in due course. Well, I'll consider that when the documents are available and wants to be done about them then. Uh, Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Um, 